The bodies of several employees of the store were lying around. I have no words. People burying their friends, their family, their parents on the backyard because they have no ability to go to cemetery. Aviation bombing the city every day. I didn't see hundreds of bodies there. I walked around the market, there is a body, and then another body lies. My friend told me that our childhood friend got grenade fragment in his leg, so he is now wounded, and he's in hospital trying to be alive. I started asking the guys at the shelter, maybe someone has a laptop. And that week, I easy finished the project and calmly sent the project. They just put down their mortars and start beating on a convoy of civilian cars with an almost direct line of fire. The roof of the Diwu Lanos was ripped off, blown to pieces. People were bleeding and falling out. I can connect with the parents of my sister, March 21, no connection with them, and I don't know, are they alive at all? Yesterday my, my friend told me that uh, in his near to his house, uh, lying free died people because of uh, fire, because of uh, bomb. After we left, we realized that we had nothing else. What we have is life. It's already, it's already a lot, because a lot of people don't have it anymore. My name is Ilya. I am from the city Mariupol. Now I am in Vinitsa. I came here. I left Mariupol. I am Ivan. I'm from Kharkiv. I'm 18 years old and I'm motion design. My name is Misha. I am doing 3D, also do 3D simulation. At the moment I am in Poland. I used to live in Ukraine. My name is Kong, I'm from Ukraine and right now I'm living in Vietnam. I was living in Odessa, so it starts 24 February. My name is Ivan Yanchuk, I am director, art director and graduate of uh, Isai workshop courses, motion design and uh, making PR video courses. My name is Alexander Voychenko, I am a freelance motion designer. I have been in 3D for two years. My name is Anton Antipenko, I am a motion designer. I used to live in Kharkiv, now I temporarily moved to the west because of the war in Ukraine. My name is Elisa, I'm originally from Donetsk. For the last 8 years I lived in Kiev and studied to be a graphic artist. Now I am doing 3D motion design. My name is Igor, I do 3D graphics and motion design. My name is Vitaly, this is Bogdan. We lived in Kiev for about half a year. Together with the graduates of Yasov's workshop, we organized a motion graphic apartment. We lived without incidents and worked. My name is Victor, I'm from Kharkiv, and now I was forced to move to, to another city, to Zolte Vody. Now I live here. There is a full-scale war going on in Ukraine right now. Russia invaded my country on February 24th, early in the morning. There is still military action, explosions. People have to hide in shelters every day, running out of their homes several times as soon as they hear sirens. The situation with Bucha and with Mariupol, I'm afraid that it will be much worse in Mariupol. People were standing, a missile fell in the line, six people died. The military arrived, threw them on the armor and took them away. At least they took them to morgues and hospitals. They said that they brought a lot of wounded there. And then it all collapsed, all hospitals collapsed, and bodies started appearing here and there, covered or not. People would look, there was a dead person, they would at least take out a blanket and cover him up. There was nowhere to take them out and no one to do it. I have uh, friends and family in Mariupol, the uh, hottest spot now. 19% of city destroyed. Uh, people have no food, no water, and no gas. A lot of people were killed. It is not what I heard from the news. This is what I heard from uh, my family and from my friends. At 4 to 4.30 in the morning, my wife jumped up on the bed and clutched at my hand from the explosion. 
I immediately call my mother. Turns out that the first shell, I don't know if it was a hurricane or a tornado missile. It was something very powerful. It fell four houses away from her. One house was destroyed. Two of her windows were blown out. The neighbors there had their windows blown out, too. You can't tell what it felt like. My sister, she was in Kiev at the time. She called our parents and said that they were bombing and she was in a bunker. It was very scary. I was in the Kiev region at the time and heard the explosions. My mom came to my room and said, wake up, wake up, son, wake up, son, war is start. I couldn't believe that war is start right now because I can't imagine this uh, could happen in Ukraine. A fighter jet flew right over the house. It was morning about five o'clock. There were explosions outside the window. I went to Telegram, started reading what was going on. After about five minutes, I realized that Russia had really attacked Ukraine. No matter what Russia does here, no matter what goals they pursue, no matter what it justifies itself with. So it is an absolute nothing against them invading the territory of another country. They have no right to do that, and hopefully, in time, they will be punished accordingly. My acquaintances from Donetsk are sure that the missiles arriving in Donetsk, especially Tochkiyu missiles, are coming from Ukraine. And they believe that Ukraine is attacking the Donetsk Republic and Luhansk Republic. And I hear some explosion behind the window on the streets. And I open the telegram and see that a lot of explosion there, all of territory of Ukraine. And uh, I was really shocked about because of this information. I understand this is happening. I woke up my guys of who are living in, with me and my apartment, and uh, they didn't believe me. I said they need to pack some clothes and be ready to leave out. Ivan wakes us up and tells us, it started. Pack your clothes. We're leaving. February 24th, completely changed, our plans and our lives in general. This was like before, and after. There were very distinct explosions, that is, the windows were shaking, it was impossible to ignore it somehow. My first thought was, of course, that maybe it was some kind of accident under the windows because I have a big road near my house. Then another explosion. I pick up my phone, trying to google something. With those words in my eyes there is no internet. I turn off the Wi-Fi, turn on the mobile internet. And the first news is that Russia has attacked Ukraine. That is, Putin announced a special operation in Ukraine. I woke up at 7 o'clock, felt anxious that something was wrong, picked up my phone and saw many messages. The most memorable one was from my friend, Elisa, get up, the war has started. It was the fourth or fifth day, approximately. We spent the night in the shelter. All over Ukraine people go down when there is an air raid alarm. We had them knocked out in the first days and we had already begun to orient ourselves by the level of explosions, went down into the shelter and then sat there. For about a week I lived in the shelter. It was a restaurant of my friend's parents. There were about 30 to 40 of us citizens living there. Every night we were on duty near the entrance to this shelter. Because there was a lot of news that sabotage groups of occupants were moving around Kiev, and we were on duty for two hours, two people at a time. When a war had been started, I wasn't scary or something because I saw war before. I thought that they will bump the military objects and maybe a couple of uh, neighborhood because they did it in Mariupol when uh, I was leaving them in uh, 2015 and 2014. I had time to assemble the computer, but I left the case there. I just packed everything else in my backpack. I wrapped my things around it, and that's how I transported the stuff. I also took a monitor to the PC. I just carried it in my hands, in a box. It was funny. When the war started, I had about two days to finish a 3D animation project for a company. I started asking the guys at the shelter, maybe someone had a laptop. I had the project on cloud storage. And in general I could have finished it on any computer. I found a laptop from a person, then asked a friend in Montenegro to leave me a computer for a week so I could work on it remotely. Due to the limitations of the laptop I was not able to do 3D graphics. My friend left me his computer, and he went to the border with Ukraine to help the refugees. That week I finished the project. And. I handed it in with no stress. If I did not have a remote job with a normal income, now I just do not know how I would survive. Because, for example, my sister and her husband don't work, my parents too, and so on. 
and it's cool that I have this job, that I have the opportunity to help everybody and with great pleasure. I've been coming into motion design since last January, which is the beginning of 2021. But not that I haven't regretted it. It's my best acquisition I've made in my life. ATMs don't work. You can't withdraw money. And a lot of people went into chaos. Panic. When you hear words like that from a family member. I'm afraid. Of everything, I'm scared. You yourself become afraid, too. And it fills you too. We bought groceries, tried to pay, and mono bank didn't work. Yeah, the banks really stopped working, suspended. I was like, what's up, I can't pay with my own money like groceries. I was like, what? There were crowds in the store. Like all the groceries were swept away. We could barely find meat there. Basic stuff like buckwheat, cereal, rice, all kinds of stew, they just swept it away. They were just gone. And there were huge lines. There was the only store in town. The territorial defense came and guarded it to keep order because there were big lines. There was shelling, rockets were flying around all the time, and people were nervous. They brought foodstuffs from all the warehouses in the city that still remained. I know that the military opened these warehouses and let store assistants in and brought food from there. So there was at least some supplies left. I am amazed at the bravery of those people. The people who worked there. And one day there was a very heavy shelling. And I heard that they got there. The next day we went to see what happened there. It was like a small shopping center, it was burned to the ground inside. There were the bodies of these few workers of this store, lying around. It was horrible, no doubt. They had been doing something for almost a month to make sure people had food. I mean, the only place where people could get food. And they died. <laughs> After two hours, after explosion is finished, after my boys take some clothes, some things, we go into market. And Nikolai Perichatka, this guy from my team, calling me in the morning and said me that, bro, it's a shit, it's war in Ukraine, it's war in Kyiv. You need to go to a safe place and uh, wait for Finnish explosion there. He said me that I need to come to their home because near of Nikita's home, he have a um, bomb shelter, good bomb shelter, but we had a uh, big problem that no taxis, no subway, no bus or another city transport not working in Kyiv in 24 February. So I'm calling for Oleg, man who study now in ESI workshop uh, for my friend now. <laughs> yeah, Oleg said to me, yes, okay, bro, give me one hour, I will come to you and pick up you and your friends. So I said, okay, thank you, Oleg, and I want to thank you, thank you, ESI workshop, because of that they have a good community, people who study in ESI workshop really want to help another guys. The water was gone very quickly. We filled baths as much as we could, so we had a supply of water. Then the electricity went out. Basically, after five days, the city was already in the Stone Age. The first days we were still watching the news, we understood that Russia will not be able to quickly occupy the whole Ukraine and we all calmed down. And then the communication and the internet was gone, and we don't know anything. All the rumors about green corridors, all the rumors about relatives, who's alive, who's dead, you only find out by rumor. On March 5th, there was a rumor that there was a green corridor, and we went out, tried to find the police. We got there, saw that everything had been bombed. Eventually, we got to the center of town. The military was there, the military said there was no green corridor, it was dangerous to leave. From the side of Melitopol the city of Berdyansk was taken, and already from that side Russian troops. We understand that we have Russian troops from the east and from the west. And the military say we can't leave the city, because they shoot everyone who leaves the city for the west. And the shelling started already in the city, and it was there before that. There were not many shelters, they were all full. We had a second apartment in town. We went there. We spent one night at a friend's place, in an underground parking garage. Then we went back to our apartment, where we still had gas. We spent three nights in the apartment. The rest of the nights we spent in the shelters. There was an ATB supermarket on the ground floor of this house. This supermarket had a shelter with warehouses, they were already empty. It was all taken out in the first days. The shelter was locked. One evening I heard someone kicking in the door. 
I went downstairs, there were guys from a neighboring staircase and they were breaking down the shelter with crowbars and sledgehammers. I helped them, they opened it up and set up a bomb shelter. There was also a large room, cold storages. We spent the next few days clearing it all out, taking out the trash. And we made it so that it was possible to stay there. And then we started to take people in, because the next day people already started to come from other houses. People who could not stay at home started coming down from this house because the shots were so heavy that it was impossible to stay at home. When glass was flying out of the neighboring apartments, we went down into the shelter and were there for almost two weeks. This is a very scary experience. First of all, you realize at some point that the shelter is not going to protect you from a direct flight of rocket into it. The basement is not a bomb shelter, and you realize that if it blows up somewhere right next door, it won't protect you. Well, at least it protects you from shrapnel. Uh, a lot of my friends moved to uh, Romania or Poland. I feel uh, so bad to hear the news every day about Ukraine. My boys from my team come to Khmelnytsky and came to Dnipro because he is my family, it's my motherland. And when I came to my parents, I had no sleep a few days because of we hiding in bomb shelters. My attitude to life was changed. Vitaly and I went to Khmelnytsky. My parents are here. My grandmother is here. There's a place to live. Ivan Yanchuk went to his family in Dnipro. The fourth of us Bogdan. He went to Chernobyl because he used to live there. It turns out we all went to our towns and have been sitting in our homes ever since. Now I live in Lviv, and my friends and I were sheltered by an old acquaintance of ours. He sheltered us and a few other refugees. In about three or four days he was taken away by the army for exercises. So now he's left us to fend for his house. He's training at the firing range there himself. I'm in Poland with my sister. My parents stayed in Ukraine. My mother recently broke her arm. It was very painful for me and was such a difficult time. So how my day is changed? If you live in Kharkiv, your day is like you are not getting out, you are not able to walk out. I mean, you can, but it's very dangerous because you can catch a bomb. So <laughs> if you live in Kharkiv, your day is like you are not getting out, get some food. Food supplies were running out quickly. No one made a month's supply. Everyone stocked up for a day, two or five days. All the stores were smashed in the city. Everything you can imagine in a peaceful city, it smashed. And you start walking around looking for something. I, for example, was in a drugstore. They got cleaned out in the first few days. But I still went into the smashed pharmacies, looking for medicine. If there was no medicine, you would go into the abandoned staff room. You find a packet of tea there, a jar of sugar, you know. Somewhere you go to this market. That's what we managed to buy potatoes for. Everything else we stole from broken stores. How do you say stealing, you know, when the fighting starts around the city and people go around and break in and steal. It's looting. And when the whole city is smashed, it's no longer looting, it's survival. You just go and look for what you can get. You look for water from wells. And we have very few wells in town. In all the time I didn't drive my cars. That is, we had full fuel in cars, and I didn't drive the car because I understood that there was no gasoline. There is none in town, it's impossible to get it. I driven once for water, got a lot of bottles of water, drove to a well. Then I heard that a few days later a rocket came to the same well, and there was a line queue there too. That's pretty much it. Every time you go out it's a big con whether you come back or not. And I know some story from friend of my friend. He now staying at occupied territory. Russian soldiers take him from the home and uh, he was in prison. He was in prison about two or three weeks. 21 days, yes. So we're not about the ocean. This key here in your country, it can be with you in your home. My friend told me that our childhood friend got grenade fragment in his leg, so he is now wounded. In he's in hospital, trying to be alive. Uh, also, two weeks ago, uh, a big explosion in market, in technology market, uh, uh, was near to my friend's house. So, in fortunate that uh, my friend's house specifically is not damaged, but only a little bit. Running around the city, I saw our third hospital. Do you remember? There was a lot in the information field about the maternity hospital being bombed and so on. It was shot at twice. Then I know rescuers came there and the military took it all out. When I went to get water, I drove through there, it was more or less. A little battered, but partially. 
And then three days later I was walking to my brother, through the same place. And there was already the whole facade of the hospital, all the facades of these buildings, they were all trashed. I don't even know how to describe it. Apparently, it was a cluster shell that was releasing a lot more shrapnel, because the trees at the 3 meter level were torn down. Not cut down, but you know, ripped off. Plus there were a lot of more craters there. And one such example that I remember is a tree about 30 centimeters in diameter, somewhere like that, yeah. It was just ripped out by the root. It's a piece of land like that. It's ripped out and it's lying on the road, and there's a hole in it. I mean, that's what hit there, that one tree was just blown away, and another tree was ripped out and put down. In another place, I was walking to my brother's house when I passed the building, and right next to the driveway like this. Well, that is, 7 or 8 meters from the entrance to the entrance. The hole is 10 meters deep. Imagine 10 meters. There's a car in the hole and it's not sticking out. You can't even get to it. And the cars are scattered like splinters. I don't know how our two cars survived. In our yard, where we lived, where this basement of the ATB, there were about 60 cars there, maybe 5 of them left. Yeah, our two were one of them. I told you, 5 cars survived, 2 of them were ours. The rest were destroyed. Some were destroyed by shrapnel, some by a direct hit, and some by fire. That is, a missile hit a car, one caught fire, the other caught fire. A lot of people just won't get out in any way because they don't have anything to drive on. I recently saw a video where someone posted. They shot my dad's house. We picked him up from Vastashni, then we took him into town, and then we drove out of town separately. I saw a video of his house from Vastashni recently. It went like this. It's a house with two entrances. It's a nine-story building. There's a piece of the first entrance and a piece of the second. And the whole thing is ruined. Do you remember the Nikolavska Oda? There are buildings on the sides, and between them is empty. The building fell down. And there are a lot of houses like that there. Have you know the cyborg shop community is big and we have a lot of friends from different uh, parts of our beautiful country and uh, some of these guys live now in the occupied territories and uh, and uh, every time we're trying to be on the line and communicate with their what's going on is everything is okay and they tell us that in some parts of our country in Kharkiv in Chernigiv in Mariupol it's a big humanitarian problem because they have no opportunities for normal life they not have uh, food they not have uh, water they not have medicine and they just sitting in bomb shelters and uh, praying for everything finish soon I hope for all of Ukrainian peoples who stay now in you know, occupied territories and territories where now it's going war that hell will finish soon yeah and everything be okay most of my family stayed in Donetsk they didn't want to leave they didn't want to leave their homes and all eight years they've been there in the epicenter of war they mostly live in the center so shells don't come there as much but all the same it's scary they're hiding in shelters my father is currently fighting in a hot spot. It's the Luhansk region. Severodonetsk. The city is under fire every day. He tries to call once a day for 40 seconds, because he just can't talk anymore. Just to let me know he's alive. There is constant shelling. The civilians of the Luhansk region are being asked to evacuate because Russians just shoot wherever they hit. They don't have the target. There is no goal to shoot at military facilities. They shoot at civilians, and every day both military and civilians die there. Yesterday my, my friend told me that uh, in his near to his house, uh, lying free died people. Because of uh, fire, because of uh, bombs, I don't know. But uh, war is getting closer and closer. So before I only heard it in news, but nowadays, in, in, at this time, it's getting to my friends already. I was happy to move out this for, from the city, but uh, the friends which are in the city now in Kharkiv, they got real problems. My friends from Marupo sent me photos where the building in front of them are burning and there are some buildings where uh, half of the house are destroyed. I called my neighbor and he said me that people's bodies are laying on the ground and uh, people burying their friends, their family, their parents on the backyard because they have no ability to go to cemetery. Aviation bombing the city every day 
and people have no electricity, have no connection to internet, the cellular, so they can't check the news. They don't know what happened at all. 100% sure that Ukraine left them and that nobody don't want to help them. This is catastrophic. So. Mariupol, this is one of the scariest things that humanity have ever seen. We left Mariupol on the 16th, March 16th. When we were still in the city, I walked around it. That is, I had my brother in another bomb shelter, my cousin in the third bomb shelter, and I moved around the city center a little bit. Back then there was no such thing as the shooting of civilians right in the head, like in Bucha. Because there were battles, and both ours and the Russians were moving around different parts of the city all the time. That is, Russians came in, Ukrainians beat them out, Russians from the other side came in, ours beat them out. That is, the the entire city was under fire. There was no time for anyone to occupy any building. So they did not occupy the city, they could not enter it. But even then there were a lot of bodies on the street. I even tried not to tell my wife for a long time what I saw. But I didn't see hundreds. I was walking through the market, there's a body lying there. And also there's body lying here too. I think the main target of uh, the enemy is to demoralize us, to make us feel bad, to make us worry, to make us cry because of dead peoples, because of ruined cities. And I think the most important thing is to not worry, to be strong, not think about it as something like an end of the world. Before we went to Lviv, we had to go home and pack everything. We walked up to the 25th floor. The elevator did not work. We began to gather things. Suddenly, the house began to shake, a very loud bang outside the window. I went up, and from my window I could see a huge cloud of smoke from the explosion about two kilometers away. My whole body starts to shake. Quickly you start to gather all your things, the siren starts howling. You go down the stairs from the 25th floor with your computer in your hands. And you're worried that a shell is not going to hit your house. On March 10th to 12th, there was another rumor that there was a green corridor. We gathered in several cars and drove to the exit from the city. At the exit from the city we were not allowed out by our military, they said. Guys, the city is surrounded, and everything that leaves the city, they shoot. So they just wouldn't let the civilians out. Civilians started to be let out when this more or less official green corridor came. It's also very relative. The first one that jumped out was my brother. He was with other relatives in another place. They lived in the apartment for a very long time. He had two children. And one day he came running to me in the shelter. He ran running in, saying, we're leaving. I said, go ahead. And that's it, and let's go. And you don't know if they made it, they didn't make it. Then he told me that they drove, they drove, they were passed along the road. At some point they reached Vasilivka. There the column was at another roadblock. And here he is telling, saying, here our troops are standing here. We see such a valley, you know, a small one. He says, you can see that on that side are our Ukrainian military positions. On the other side are Russian positions. And they are shooting at each other. So there hasn't been a cancellation of fire yet. And at some point, says, the Russians understand that they can't pass. They just turn down their mortars and start firing almost direct fire at the column of civilian vehicles. Here's the column standing. It's not even going. It's standing because the whole road there is like that. You go, you stand, you go, you stand. Many kilometers of convoys of cars. It's scary. He says. They were standing. In a convoy. There was a Diwu Lanos in front of them. And just the Lanos went to pieces, the roof came off, went to pieces. Bloody people fell out of the car. And it turned out that it was on the Ukrainian side. That is all Ukraine is already there, where our troops are. And he says the whole column. So they start rushing around, jumping out, skipping over there and breaking through as best they can. By miracle. Yes, they escaped by miracle. So on March 15th this column, which was officially allowed to go through the green corridor, was attacked. And we were on our way on March 16th. And on that day, when I had already decided for myself internally that we were leaving, we packed up all the belongings we had and loaded them into the cars. But such shelling began that it was not even possible to leave. And we spent the whole day. I'm in the shelter, as soon as it's over, I come out. Just you think that now it will be possible to go. It starts all over again. And at some point our guys, the Ukrainian armed forces, came in, they were moving around the courtyards and standing there in one place too, waiting out the shelling. And at some point there was no shooting. I just ran up to one of the military, I said. Do you guys know how long the pause of shooting will last, will we have time to get out or not? We're two cars, family of five. He says, come on, you have five minutes. And we just ran in with everything we had. I throw my computer to the car. 
It was amazing that I got him out of there, jumped in the car, and started to drive away. Obviously, we didn't make it to the avenue. It was dangerous. We began driving out into the courtyards, and then this mortar fire started behind us, roughly speaking, from where we had just been, so we backed out through the neighboring block. And it was already quieter there and already there we went to Primorsky district. Everyone drove through it these days. And now they say, what goes on there, that just terrible. And when we left the city and got a connection, my brother was shaking the whole way, we called him, he was afraid that we again would be in this place as well. We got through more or less normally. That day they were taking everyone out of there just like that. So that's how we got out. Russian invasion changed my life. Now I have in my house. I lost my house in Mariupol. I can connect with the parents of my sister, marriage 21, no connection with them. And I don't know, are they alive at all? All my brothers and my dogs, my family uh, moved to Germany, but now I can because I'm 18 years old and I can leave the country because of war. When the war, war started, uh, I lost my job because my company just closed it uh, and I don't have money to do something. I lost uh, all my friends. I lost my house. I need to move to another country for save your life. And uh, I couldn't believe it uh, that this happened in Ukraine. So the question is, how did the Russian invasion change my life? It didn't change my life. Life has to be restarted completely from scratch. For a while we didn't understand all this. We thought it would go away. Now we realize that we were left without homes. My father has an apartment, my mother has a house, my parents have an apartment, we have an apartment, and so on. It's all gone. After we left, we realized we had nothing else. What we have is life, it's already there. It's already a lot, because a lot of people don't have it anymore. But life has changed completely. This incident changed a lot of people because everyone immediately considered that mobility is very important today. All this invasion has changed the attitude to the neighboring country, to Russia. I understand that there are adequate people among Russians, and I know them. But based on what's going on now, it's about 70% of the population just wishing death on the Ukrainian people. The Russian invasion changed my life twice. The first time, when I was a child of 11, I had to leave my hometown, my friends, my family, and start a new life. And eventually, the second time Russia deprived me of the opportunity to continue my usual life, and I had to run away on a train with a cat, with a small backpack, to another country, for the second time. The attitude toward Russia has changed dramatically, especially to the citizens who live there and it probably won't change back in my life. It's the most terrible thing I've ever done. And the people who let them not say after 10 or 15 years that we were fooled by propaganda and so on. Everybody has an opportunity now to see all that information which is replicated in world mass media. That is not to believe it. This man deliberately convinces himself that he cannot have anything to do with such evil that his country is doing. He is deluding himself. And this leads to the fact that it continues. Internally, the citizens support this regime, and the regime gets carte blanche to continue. Just as horrible. So this is now their passive support for what is going on. I have a lot of friends. All over Ukraine. And all I hear from everyone is that there is terrible stuff going on. There is some horrible persecution going on. It's really genocide. Very skilled guys who could have had a great future are being killed. For what? For what? I don't understand. So this is just some kind of terrorist act against Ukrainians. I wanted to say thank you. To all of the military. For protecting my family, Ukraine. Also, I would like to say. That we have created a project to support Ukraine. If you have the opportunity, then transfer money to the troops of Ukraine. 
and tried to volunteer. Me and my team, we created an NFT and trying to sell it. All of money from this NFT, we will transfer to people who suffered because of Russian invasion, because of this war. And I think we should do everything for help people who suffered because of the war. I can safely continue to work now, because all my orders come from abroad, and their war has not touched them. For example, I have friends who worked for Ukrainian companies, and they have essentially lost their jobs now, because now this direction of work in Ukraine is practically dead. And all those who worked for Ukrainian companies now try to make mostly charity videos or cover all the events in the country. I try to help in any way I can. I make NFTs, which I now plan to put up for sale and send all the profits to the armed forces of Ukraine and send them to the people who suffered from Russian aggression. In addition to that, I also need to support myself. So now I'm doing something that I've been putting off for a long time. I finally registered on Upwork and found a very cool job there. And now I'm working on Upwork, doing small sketches in 3D. And that's how I'm getting myself up to speed. So a lot of people are now trying to move to European or uh, English speaking uh, market and the world is helping, they giving us uh, work, they giving us the projects, they message us in uh, social medias and trying to help as much as possible. My day schedule I changed, now I'm trying to sleep more, to doing sports more, because uh, I think that uh, keeping myself healthy is one of the most important things right now. I'm trying to check in news less and work more to have my mind clear. Mentally it is very difficult. Because I try to work, and most of the day I still spend looking at pictures of Mariupol. I try not to reflect and get distracted and go to work. But still you wake up, you look for news and go to sleep. You look for news throughout the day. You get distracted by it periodically. And some news just doesn't make it work. When I saw Bucha, I just couldn't do anything else that day. The war affects how I work now pretty badly, what kind of day I have and what kind of focus I have. If before I could, conditionally speaking, from 8 to 9 in the morning. Well I work from home and work until 2 or 3 in the night because the work is cool. Motion design is all very exciting. And you're not working under the radar. With great pleasure and there was high productivity. And now that's not there. A lot of the news you read about, they focus your attention. It's hard to pull yourself together. It's hard to do big tasks in any sane time frame. Naturally, the sirens are annoying. They are annoying both day and night. The first day I had inner problem because I, I want to try to help place to, to country and maybe trying to get uh, into territorial defense, but uh, understanding that I can bring more impact and more and give more help to country if I just will do what I can the best. I have now stopped work on the topless project. This is because their advertisers are mostly Yandex. In general, companies that do not have a very good reputation. For example, Yandex was hiding requests for Bucha. Most of the projects became frozen. Some were made for Russian-speaking people. More precisely, for Russia. This gave such an push to move something on their own. Because if before everyone was just coming from acquaintances, now they began to approach me with more marketing, to promote myself, to look for orders, to look for customers, and so on. Most of the client orders I took were all from Ukraine. Now, they don't need advertising, exactly commercials, because that's the situation. In general, I'm very bad at searching for orders. All my orders are by word of mouth and now no word of mouth is working. That is, all my acquaintances, who were in Ukraine, all somewhere there, all moved. Everything is broken for everyone. Now I found one order on Upwork for people from Britain. They have medicine project, a hospital, plus one order. I've already got the guys from the ISIVs workshop on board, so it's kind of possible to work, but it's hard. Since November or December of last year we have found customers who are located in Europe and in the United States. So now a war situation, 
it does not affect our work in general. So here the problem is more with us, that we are not as productive. We are not so concentrated right now. We have to turn down certain orders. So we do not have time to do everything that we could do. Who is planning to start learning this profession? Post-processing, or motion design? Guys, the world is so huge, so many millions of people, and everyone needs specialists. If you try hard, there is absolutely no problem finding a job. I'm not working now. I'm doing a course post-production. The deadlines on the course were extended a little, which gave me more time to really finalize the work to make a good quality product. So far, all my free time I invest in getting through the course well, and, accordingly, after the course to go to freelance markets. Even the same upwork. Accordingly, to find orders. The day before the war, I enrolled in the post-processing 3.0 course from ESAV's workshop. And now, the time of recording, is the 6th of April, the beginning of this course. I am looking forward to the lessons. The workshop is a place where you can find like-minded people and friends, kind, responsive people. At first, I was afraid to go there, then, I still decided to take a chance, and not for nothing, I think. When I first started training, I could not even believe that I was in the workshop. It seemed to me that this was some kind of dream. I really like these courses, a lot of knowledge. The work on the mistakes is enormous. You grow if you work. I don't regret one bit that I went to the workshop and bought another course before the war. If Mariupol, or rather not if, but when Mariupol returns to full Ukrainian control, after the war, I'll probably go there someday, to visit, for sure. But to live there, I don't know. Very unlikely, I plan to go back to Kiev. I love this city very much. In the last few days I've heard that the Kiev region has finally been liberated. I don't recommend going back there yet, because Kiev is still being shelled, and missiles are flying into the Kiev region, and no one is immune to the possibility of a missile falling on a residential building. Overall, I plan to go back there and continue to live there. After the end of the war, uh, me and my friends uh, want to get, get uh, back to the city uh, just to rebuild it, to live there, because especially me, I, I really love the city, I love the parks, uh, the streets of it, the center of the city. I don't want to go back to my hometown because, first of all, it absolutely destroyed. They, I lost everything I loved in their city and I want to move forward. I want to try to work in uh, Europe. When the war will be over, I will return to Kyiv. Big project are waiting for us. It will definitely not stop. Have said, what does it kill you make you stronger? So make a really big project. The opportunity for create something really cool, something that many people in all the world can enjoy. Before the war began, I plan to go to Asia, to live there for six months, to talk to other people, to learn something, and in this way develop myself. That is, to bring something new into my life. Now, it is not a secret that all men from 18 to 60 years old are not allowed to travel, with few exceptions. That is why I am staying in Ukraine. If the war ends, first of all I will go back to my city, to my relatives. Then it all depends on the situation. Now I have no such thought in my head that there is a war in my country and it will be destroyed, that there will not be a good life here. I am against such an opinion. I believe that Ukraine has a great future. The whole world supports Ukraine because there will be a very low base for investments here. And if the political and military situation is right, more precisely, the absence of war, investments will come and Ukraine will live better than before the war. That's why I would like to go back to my city. The first time I moved to Kiev, it was because of the partying, the designers, the motion designers. We could go to hangouts, socialize, exchange contacts, connections and so on. Now, everything has moved to the internet sphere. So I'm staying in my city for now, and then I will think what to do next. But I'm not going back to Kiev. I'm still in doubts. I like Kiev very much. I'm already used to it, I've lived there for four years. Somehow it has already become my native city. But now I don't know. If the main priority of staying there was to hang out, 
we used to meet all the time. It was cool, it had some kind of meaning. And now just renting an apartment there doesn't make sense to me. Although there, I'm sure friends and comrades will come back. To the dudes from Ukraine, who are engaged in motion design. I recommend that they give up working with the Russian Federation as much as possible and focus on Western clients. I have noticed a tendency that clients are divided into two types of people. Those who really want to work with Ukrainians, because they want to, to help us because they know how hard it is here. The second type of people are those who are afraid to invest in Ukrainian motions designers, because it is not clear whether they will have an opportunity to work actively on the project or whether a rocket will come to their house. There is such a fear among people that it will be difficult to bring an order to the end. That's why we mostly talk about long-term orders. I would advise the guys in our field to communicate with other guys, to unite with them as a unit. Together you can come up with new ideas for new projects and find solutions to problems. We have a very close-knit community here now, everyone is happy to help each other. You can come to me. Maybe I will find a job for you. If you have an aptitude for work, maybe you can become an art director, then you will not need a powerful computer, you can just supervise the artistic component of the projects. The main thing is not to get locked up in yourself, don't get locked up in your own thoughts. Interact with your classmates and share all of your concerns. I would advise the guys to think about security, both offline and online. Secondly, keep money for a rainy day. And thirdly, learn languages so you can communicate with people from different countries. The most important thing that you can do now both for yourself and for the country is to try to earn as much as you can and at the same time to be able to either help the army with deductions to formalize the FOP of the second or third category. To work with foreigners who attract foreign currency into the country. First of all, it's also your economic condition. You will live better, and that will naturally help the country as well. The first thing I would advise anyone who's not in the military business is if there's an opportunity to get out of the city where the fighting is coming, not rocket fire. There can be rocket fire all over Ukraine but exactly where the troops are advancing. We need to get out of there as early as possible, take the equipment with us and leave, and then work. What are we left to do? The people who are in our field need to come together. That's how we have a fart department. Create the local groups where they can move together and do orders, projects together and pump not only hard skills as performers, but also soft skills, their personality. You can learn to roll the dice, but to communicate with people, with clients, and even one lesson does not learn. And learn Unreal Engine, because then you will make render in 15 minutes and get a buzz out of it. If I do a scene in Red Shift for two days, Bogdan does it in 20 minutes, 800 frames. It's unbelievable. The main thing is to take care of yourself and your loved ones. I recommend to keep evolving, mastering new programs, like Unreal Engine, Unreal is the future, as we say. This word taught me that every limit in your head and your problems are not problems at all. Before the war, I wanted to buy powerful PC and I thought that my weak laptop, uh, this is limit for me. I can work, I can do something, I need RTX 3019, um, AMD Threadripper to animate the square. But now I saw that every limit is only in your head and you can do whatever you want in almost every situation. So don't give up if you have problems right now. When the war is over, try to work here, develop here and show that Ukrainian motion designers are the best motion designers in this universe. This is a very difficult time that we're going through. It's scary, because we don't know what's going to happen next. There's already so much grief, in the country. There are no words, just... Russian warship, fuck you, that's what I'm saying. We should crush, them and live normally.